Hello, my name is Misty, and I'm here to talk to you about safety today. Woohoo! All right, here we go. All right, so we're going to cover different types of injuries and how to prevent them PPE, use of tools, MSDSs, as well as recycling materials. Well, we're going to have a lot of key terms. Uh, some of them are acetone, acetylene, earplugs. Electrical shock, ground, pickups, flash burn, glasses, forced ventilation, ultraviolet light, infrared light, different types of fire extinguishers, visible lights, warning labels, and welding helmets. Here we go. So, safety is important and it's a huge deal. Many injuries are caused by other individuals, meaning the guy who was unsafe is unlikely to hurt his or herself, but others. If an accident occurs on a site, it can result beyond just permanent injury or personal injury. All right, so we're going to start talking about burns. Burns are the one, the one of the most common injuries when we weld. Burns can not only happen from touching something hot, they can also be caused by UV light. UV light is emitted when welding and can cause burns like sunburn in seconds and minutes. This is why proper PPE is important. UV burns can also be in the eye called flash burn. The eye is exposed to UV light and it causes a burn to the eye which can be very painful and burns are categorized by severity. So now we're going to talk about first degree burns. First degree burns are on the surface of the skin and the skin will be red, tender and probably painful. If you get a first degree burn, put it under cold water, not ice water or ice, until the pain decreases. Do not apply butter, grease, or any homemade remedy because it will hurt more. Okay? So make sure the burn is covered with a sterile bandage or clean cloth. Okay? So we can see here that it is just barely burning the first part of our skin. Now second degree burns, okay? This is where blisters are formed and can break the skin. Usually this occurs when you're exposed to temperatures over 1300 degrees or wow, no, I'm off. 130 degrees. Wow. Lost my mind here. All right, the first step in treating a second degree burn is to put the area under cold water or cold compresses until the pain decreases. Using ice can intensify the reaction. In an emergency situation, any cold liquid will uh, you can drink, you can pour it on the burn. So if you have iced tea or iced water, um, we want to get the skin temperature uh, lowered as quickly as possible to avoid tissue damage. Okay. So we want to make sure that the area is clean and dry, cover the area to prevent infection, and in some instances you may need to seek uh, medical attention. If you have burns around your mouth, nose, nasal hair, you could even have problems breathing. Okie dokie, third degree burns. Third degree burns are the most serious burns. The tissue below the skin looks white or charred and burns occur around 480 degrees Fahrenheit. Initially there be, may be no pain because nerves have been damaged. Do not remove any clothing or anything that has been stuck to the burn. Doing so can result in loss of tissue and skin because ultimately you would be peeling it off of the, the body itself. Do not put ice or ice water on the burn because you can intensify the shock reaction to the burn. We want to use a cold cloth or cold, cool water on the burns when they are on the face, hands, and feet. If the victim is on fire, we want to use a rug, blanket, or jacket, or anything that can uh, smother a fire. Difficulty breathing can be common when burns are around the face, neck, and mouth. So you want to make sure that your victim is breathing if they have severe burns in this area. Okay. We want to even call for an ambulance because this is very, very severe. As we can see by the picture here, we can see in this area it's going down into the nerves and everything else, okay? All right, next, burns caused by light. 
There are three types of light, including visible, infrared, and ultraviolet light. All of these types of light can cause burns. All right, the first one, visible light. This is the light that we see. This can be produced when we weld. When we have too little light, it can also cause eye strain. Okay? Visible light is usually not hazardous unless we're like putting a flashlight or LED into our, eye, into our eyeball. Infrared light. This is the light that we feel as heat. For example, maybe you've seen the lights at um, like Denny's or somewhere like that. They're the red lights that keep your food warm. Okay, that's an infrared light. Um, this can cause a burn, and you can feel this type of light while welding. Okay, when you weld, not only are you exposed to infrared light, but probably ultraviolet light as well. Okay, ultraviolet light. This is the light we can't see. It's also the most dangerous type of light. Most welder, uh, welding burns are caused by ultraviolet light. Because you can't feel or see the light, we don't think it's doing any type of damage. Ultraviolet light can cause second or third degree burns. This is also what causes flash burn to the eyes. Most common burns areas besides the eye is to the wrist and neck. According to NIOSH, eye injuries are the most common. Welders flash or burns to the eyes due to ultraviolet light emitted from certain welding operations account for nearly 6% of all work-related eye injuries in all construction trades. This is a big deal. Okay? Distance from the arc and time exposed can also be a factor that can cause the burn. The further away from the arc, the more diffused the light becomes. Processes such as air carbon arc, GTAW, and GMAW have higher amounts of UV light. Ah, welding curtains. We love welding curtains because they protect air others in the area who might be exposed to the welding light, so we don't flash them. Onwards, we're going to talk about PPE. And let me tell you something here. So, NIOSH has a little thing. It says, Dur uh, eyes as the primary injury body part accounted for 5% of all injuries. Eye injuries accounted for 25% of all injuries to welders. That's a big chunk of eye injuries. So we need to keep that in mind when we're talking about PPE or personal protective equipment. Now, we're going to talk about different types of PPE like jackets, welding hoods, gloves, and safety glasses. This is really important. Okay, so many times you just can't wear your protective clothing all the time. So we want to minimize injury because of burns from sparks or cutting, welding, and grinding. So we need to make sure that we're welding, we're wearing welding clothing or types of welding clothing that can be worn all the time. Okay. In general, um, we need to make sure that we are uh, we are using clothing that is wool or cotton. Okay, and we don't want them to catch on fire. So let's talk about some shirts. Okay, shirts should be long sleeve and have a collar to protect your neck. If the shirt has pockets, like we have some here. It's good to have a flap over them so the sparks do not go inside and catch on fire or just don't have pockets. <coughs> a dark color should also be worn to avoid reflection of the light onto your skin. Hmm. Avoid synthetic materials like nylon, rayon, and polyester. They melt. It's very serious. It's best to wear 100% wool, cotton, or canvas uh, and fabrics like uh, the dicky materials. Okay, your clothing should not have any frayed edges. If a spark hits a frayed edge, it can catch on fire. Also, if your clothes have a lot of wrinkles or folds in them, sparks or slag can get trapped and cause them to catch on fire. We also don't want to carry a lighter in your pocket. A spark can land in your pocket or a piece of slag can land in your pocket. 
and it catches the lighter and the lighter explodes. So it's something that we don't want to find out about. Okay, next, we're going to talk about pants. Why does it matter? Well, pants should be the jean type, wool, or cotton like dickies. Any synthetic material can melt through your skin and or catch on fire. Some synthetic materials, they even produce toxic fumes when they catch on fire. So not only are you going to burn yourself, but you're going to injure your lungs as well. Additionally, you want to make sure that your pants are not cuffed. Sparks, flags, or other hot material can fall in the, the cuff itself and catch on fire. You want to wear your pants long enough to cover the tops of your boots so sparks do not go in your boot. Boots also should be high top type to keep the sparks out. And having a safety toe will also help your toes from getting crushed. Smooth topped toes also prevent sparks from being trapped in the seams. Also, when we have like some types of boots actually have the laces that go down. If a spark goes through the lace, you will actually get burned. Protective clothing. Well, we want to make sure that we have extra protection besides the normal shop wear. Leather is worn because it's lightweight. It resists burning. You can also get special materials like Kevlar uh, that resist burning and sparks. Gloves. Important to have. They protect your hands from hot work. Be sure your gloves are leather and thick enough for what you're doing. When you're working with SMAW or FCAW, you want to use thicker gloves. When doing lighter or delicate work, GTAW, uh, thinner gloves are also useful. You should also wear a jacket, uh, whether it is canvas, leather, or a combination of the two. So this is canvas, this is full leather, this has leather sleeves and canvas in the middle. I prefer that as it isn't as hot. Here are some examples of arm protection and leg and foot protection. So these are sleeves. This one is a half leather, half canvas. This is all canvas. This here is Kevlar. And you can even wear like an apron or a bib. When we wear an apron or a bib though, as we can see, there's no arm protection. Safety glasses. Well, as you probably figured out, eyes are really important that we need to protect. We have two of them. Let's keep them. So protect your eyes from any flying material like sparks, slag, uh, when we weld, any particles from uh, grinding. This is a requirement when you work in a shop. And all protection should also be ANSI Z87.1. Uh, required and it'll be actually stamped on it or the packaging will have it to know that it will protect you. Now we want to wear tinted glasses, special glasses that are going to protect us from the UV light. Okay, We do not want to wear sunglasses because they don't provide impact safety and the UV light will go right through them. Okay. Eye protection can have several different markings on it, okay, if it meets requirements. Um, ANSI Z87.1, okay, lenses can be worn. So that means I can get glasses that have that standard and it be safe. But if I'm looking for lenses, it should say Z87 plus L8, D3, and D4. This also tells me that it's impact rated glare reduction, and protection against droplets and dust. We want it to be impact rated because if maybe you have a piece of metal that goes flying, we want it to make sure that it stops it before it goes into your eyeball. Full face shields. Okay, This is good for grinding, chipping, and overhead work. Okay, This should be worn in addition to safety glasses. This is better than wearing a welding hood because you have a more ability to see well. Full face shields. Okay. This is meant when we are going to use OAC or PAC, oxyacetylene cutting or plasma arc cutting or air carbon arc. This allows us to have um, more ability to see around us while we're doing this. And it also protects our entire face from the UV radiation. 
Welding hoods. Well, there are many different types of welding hoods. A welding hood it has a light proof um, area to protect your eye, and there are many different types of welding hoods. Uh, there are lenses that stay the same no matter whether you're welding or not. So this type of hood is like a pipe liner, and usually this is a fixed shade. All right, so under your hood, in the lenses, regardless if it's auto darkening or not, there should be proper seals and insulation to protect your eyes from any light leaks. We don't want any UV light coming in, regardless if we have a fixed shade or an auto darkening hood. Now, there's an outer and inner plastic lens that's on your hood. The interior and exterior plastic lenses will need to be replaced when they get pitted and too dirty to clean. These plastic lenses protect the actual dark lens or auto darkening panel, and they also pr help protect you from more light, kind of more layers. All right, so auto darkening helmets. This is a type of helmet that goes dark when the bright light is near. There are some that only have one shade, and now commonly um, there are helmets that darken to many different shades, including a shade to grind. There are many, many different um, features each hood can have, so we're not going to go into all the features, but just know that it will go on for a bright light. Shop noise. Okay, Your hearing is extremely important. Personally, I'm hard of hearing, which has created many problems communicating with others. I am in the process of creating a compilation of American Sign Language, ASL, welding terms for you to understand. Okay. Welding, cutting, grinding, and any loud sounds can affect your hearing. Even welding in the fumes can affect your hearing. There are these tiny little hairs inside our ears that help us hear. Uh, when there's a loud sound or fumes that come in contact with these hairs, the hairs lay down, and that causes us to hear less. Those hairs can become permanently damaged with repeated high sounds or lots and lots of fumes and those little particles are landing on those hairs. We want to use hearing protection as much as possible. Now here we can see a chart of what we can hear, what's audible, and how many decibels this sound makes. And hearing protection is really important. So here's some different types of hearing protection. On the left, we have a ear muff. On the right is like a ear plug. And recently I found some ear plugs that are ANSI certified and have a Bluetooth connection. Pretty cool, right? They're called isotunes. And what happens is they're able to block noise with another sound. And if it gets too loud, it actually um, even blocks it further. Pretty cool, right? The next one, respiratory protection. All welding and cutting produces some sort of byproduct, like fumes or gases or smoke or vapors or what have you. Okay? So it's important to protect the health of your lungs and respiratory. Okay, So certain types of respirators require fitting and training. So make sure that you go through the proper training if you need to use a respirator on the job. You need to have it fit correctly, and you want to learn how to take it on and off, and of course, how to clean it and or replace the filters. There are many different types of respirators that can be used. Okay, If we see here, uh, we have different ones, some that give us air, other ones that do not. What we really want to make sure, though, is that all respiratory equipment should be certified by NIOSH, N-I-O-S-H, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, okay? So here are some of the most common ones that you can use. They're not very expensive. Um, the big thing is getting a respirator that fits under your welding hood, okay? Many respirators that are sold at a welding supply shop usually fit under your hood. So these are the ones I'm talking about, this little pink one here, this one here, and these ones here. These all will fit underneath your hood okay the last one here is more respiratory so this is fresh air so there's actually a little system it's kind of like a scuba system that actually pumps fresh air into the welding hood all right guys as usual take care and weld the world weld the world